the entire surface of the earth is covered with bacteria and other microorganisms, fungi and viral particles. And apparently there's bacteria even way down into the earth, about a kilometre down apparently there's still bacteria everywhere. And this is quite a nice natural environment, but um, other environments aren't as clean as this. Maybe you, you work in some that aren't quite as clean as this. But in any environment, uh, there's bacteria everywhere. And yet, inside my tissues, it, it's sterile. I'm pleased to tell you, as far as I know, there's no bacteria at all in, inside my thumb. In fact, I'm sure there's not, otherwise I'd probably feel ill. And I've no obvious uh, wounds or inflammatory areas there. So it's sterile inside the human body. It's quite amazing that we have this milieu of bacteria outside and yet sterile internal environments. How is this achieved? Well, there's two main things to think about, really. One is the uh, immune system uh, and the other is the lymphatic system. Th these two uh, are fairly closely tied together. So the lymphatic system is absolutely vital for this. Now, it's useful, I think, to think of the lymphatic system in, in two components, the way I think about it. There are the lymphatic capillaries and the lymphatic drainage vessels, the, the ducts, and it, well, I would include in that the, the lymph nodes as well. So lymphatic fluid is going to go from the lymphatic capillaries into the afferent lymphatic vessels, through the lymph nodes, into the efferent lymphatic vessels before it gets back to the blood. So there's that whole system of, of the lymphatic vessels. But then also in the body there's lymphoid tissue and lymphoid tissue is tissue which performs a, an immunological function. So we might think of the primary lymphatic organs like the bone marrow and, and the thymus gland where the leukocytes, the, the white blood cells, the protective cells become immunocompetent. And there's also other areas of uh, lymphoid tissue throughout the body that are sometimes called secondary areas of, of lymphatic or lymphoid tissue. So you might think of the, the tonsils, the, um, the appendix has got a lot of lymphatic tissue. There's lymphatic nodules in, in various organs and of course the, uh, the spleen is, uh, has got a lot of lymphatic tissue in it as well, performing this vital immunological function. So the lymph ducts really are, are the flow of the lymphatic fluid and the lymphoid tissue is other immunological areas of the body where these immunological cells, particularly the lymphocytes, live, it's their habitat, where they're able to recognise any antigenic challenge and above all where they're able to respond to that ant antigenic uh, challenge. So let's start our study of the lymphatic system now by looking at the formation of the tissue fluid and the lymphatic fluid, how that's drained through the lymph nodes and how that relates to the, the aim of whole body uh, immunity. So we want to think about this journey of lymphatic fluid through the body. And we already know that there are numerous arterioles that break down into huge numbers of blood capillaries in the body. Millions of capillaries, blood going in from an arteriole, blood draining out via a venule. And the fluid in the arterial end of the capillary is at higher pressure. So tissue fluid is formed at the arterial end of the capillary. And that's good because we have tissue fluid, because here we have the tissue cells that need tissue fluid. So they're bathed in this physiological tissue fluid, which is excellent. And there's large proteins in the plasma. So the proteins albumin especially, in the plasma, generate uh, an osmotic pressure. The proportion of the osmotic pressure generated by plasma proteins is called oncotic pressure. So that causes the reabsorption of the tissue fluid at the venous end. So the tissue fluid is formed at the arterial end of the capillary because the hydrostatic pressure, the blood pressure, is greater than the osmotic pressure but the tissue fluid is reabsorbed at the venous end because the osmotic pressure is now greater uh, than the hydrostatic pressure, so there's more sucking in. 
And, and most tissue fluid is reabsorbed like this, but not all of it. Some tissue fluid is left in the tissues. And as well as this, sometimes um, plasma proteins escape. They get out of the blood vessels where they're supposed to be contained and they escape. Now, if we have plasma proteins that have escaped, these are going to be very osmotic molecules and that's going to suck water. They're going to attract water to them. So if we have a lot of proteins in the tissue spaces, then that's going to lead to edema. It's going to be swelling in the tissue spaces and that's bad for all sorts of reasons. It increases the diffusional distance that the oxygen has to travel, for example, or the distance that the carbon dioxide has to travel to get from the cells back into the blood. We don't want this excessive tissue fluid. So we have to get rid of some tissue fluid and importantly we have to get rid of um, any proteins that escape uh, as well. Absolutely vital that these are, are taken away from the tissue spaces. And as well as that, sometimes bacteria get into the tissue spaces. Maybe a cut, maybe a burn, maybe an infection. And bacteria left on their own devices can double in number every 20 minutes or half an hour. So we don't want to leave those in the tissue spaces for too long because we're going to get a rip roaring infection. So these all need to be taken away from the, from the tissue spaces. Unfortunately, we have a system that does exactly that. So in between the cells in the tissues here, we have these uh, blind ended lymphatic capillaries like this. So finger like projections, blind ended lymphatic capillaries like this. And these drain away to form larger uh, lymphatic vessels, slightly larger lymphatic vessels. And what happens is the excess tissue fluid is drained into these blind ended lymphatic capillaries. And from there it drains away like this. And these lymphatic vessels here that we've drawn in green, the larger ones, so there's another, another set of capillaries there, the whole system of these. And these, these larger ones have valves to ensure one way flow of the um, lymphatic fluid away from the tissues. So I would say that any fluid that is in the tissue is a tissue fluid. But once it crosses over into the lymphatic capillary, then I would then define that as lymphatic fluid becomes lymphatic fluid once it gets into this lymphatic drainage system. And as well as that, the escaped uh, proteins will go into the lymphatic capillaries. Because remember, we don't want those hanging around and they too will be drained away. And as the escape proteins are drained away, that's going to lower the osmotic pressure of the tissue spaces, meaning that the edema will not develop because there's no longer these large protein molecules to suck the water to themselves to increase the volume of fluid in the tissue spaces because the protein has been, been taken away. And if there's any infection, then bacterial cells will also go into these lymphatic capillaries and also be drained away from the tissues. This is an important way that the tissues are kept sterile. Now, fortunately, the cells that line the blood capillaries, the bacteria normally can't get into those. So if there's bacteria in the tissues, that doesn't get into the blood circulation because that will cause an instant uh, bacteremia. But the capillaries can easily get into the lymphatic capillaries. So the bacteria can't get into the blood capillaries, but they can get into the lymphatic capillaries. And it's just as well as this way around, because if it wasn't, any minor tissue infection would cause um, a bacteremia with, with, of course, the great potential for, for sepsis developing in that situation. So these are taking them all away like this. Now, the lymphatic capillaries themselves, um, that we notice they're blind-ended. 
So there's only the flow of uh, lymphatic fluid away from the tissue spaces towards the more central lymphatics. But the lymphatic capillaries themselves are made up of endothelial cells uh, that, that overlap each other like this. They're flappy uh, overlapping cells forming the lymphatic capillary. This would be the other side of it. So these flappy cells like this forming the lymphatic capillary. And what this means is it's great because it means that the proteins, so uh, it, was a, it was a protein, the proteins can get through because these flaps flap in the way. They flap in the way. So increased pressure here and the proteins here will cause these cells to flap in the way, meaning the protein can get in because it flaps open. Same for the excess in tissue fluid. That can get in as well because these cells will flap in the way like this. So it will, that will flap open like that to allow material in. In this case, allowing excess tissue fluid in. But then when the fluids and the proteins are in the lymphatic capillary, that will slam the door shut. It's just like a door really, a one-way door. So th these are all like valves allowing this one-way flow. And it's the same as any bacteria as well. The, uh, the bacteria can get in by this flapping open, but then it will, it will shut to keep the material in and therefore to be drained away in the lymphatic system. So there's going to be movement, there's going to be gravity, there's going to be contraction of adjacent muscles. And this will increase the pressure in one length of the lymphatic system like this. So we notice that the valves open to allow material from there to there. But then these valves will shut to prevent retrograde flow of material. So it can only go in that one direction. So it's taken away from the, the tissue spaces. And as well as that, there's actually uh, radial anchoring filaments on some of the lymphatic cells like this. The endothelial cells that comprise the lymphatic capillary. These are uh, radial anchoring filaments because they're round about the capillary like this. And these are made of strong tissue and they're also elastic. Connective tissue and elastic tissue. And these are actually anchored into the collagen fibers that are found in the, in the tissues. Most tissues have some collagen, structural collagen within them. So these will keep the lymphatic capillaries open, facilitating a patent lumen for the flow of the lymphatic fluid through the lymphatic capillaries into these larger, into these larger lymphatic vessels. Now, um, I think I'll just show you just a bit of context and uh, just a different diagram here, really. This is from my uh, physiology notes uh, book. So here we have blood coming in at the arterial end, going through the um, blood capillary, giving up its oxygen, leaving us darker red blood like this. Here we have the uh, tissue cells. So these are the tissue cells here that comprise the specific tissue that we're in. Could be any tissue of the body, basically. Yeah, the tissue cells. As we've noted, some tissue fluid can escape. Some proteins can escape. And they're going to go into the lymphatic capillary. So let's just, uh, in this case, we'll colour the lymphatic capillary in yellow. We can see now the fluid is getting in from the tissues spaces into these blind ended lymphatic capillaries. It's not getting out, it's a one-way system. And this is then drained away into progressively larger vessels. And of course, here was the other 
lymphatic vessels draining to form progressively larger lymphatic vessels. And uh, here we see just an individual cell um, or the individual cells that make up the capillary. So this is the lumen of the lymphatic capillary. These are the endothelial cells. And as we've noticed, these are floppy uh, to allow material in. So they'll flop open to allow material in, but then they won't let the material out again. The doors will shut to stop it going out. Now, just to lead us on to the next part of this account, we notice that these vessels, these larger lymphatic vessels, taking lymphatic fluid away from the tissues, these are described as afferent lymphatic vessels. So these are afferent, as we saw there, afferent lymphatic vessels. And an afferent lymphatic vessel is any vessel which is going to be taking lymphatic fluid towards a lymph node. So afferent vessels, so this is an afferent vessel because this is going to be carrying material towards a lymph node. So next we need to think about what is happening with these lymph nodes. So what we have here, these are the afferent lymphatic vessels coming from the tissue spaces carrying the lymphatic fluid away. So these are various afferent lymphatic vessels. So what we've drawn there in green, these are these afferent lymphatic vessels. And they're carrying the lymphatic fluid away from the tissue spaces in this direction towards the lymph nodes and carry towards the lymph nodes and here we have a, a lymph node here and several of these afferent lymphatics are going to be carrying material into a lymph node and there we have a lymph node and then the one or two lymphatic vessels, large lymphatic vessels that are carrying material away from the lymph node these are exiting the lymph nodes. So these are efferent lymphatic vessels. So lymphatic fluid is taken to the lymph node via the afferent lymphatics and taken away via the exit or the efferent lymphatic vessels. And these lymph nodes are often described as uh, bean-shaped structures. They're encapsulated, they have a capsule around the outside. The size varies quite a bit from about one to about 25 millimeters. So a decent lymph node, when it's in a physiological situation, not in a disease situation, is about maybe 10 centimeters, 10, 15 centimeters in diameter. And as we've said, there's a capsule around about it of dense connective tissue. So th these, are, uh, these are encapsulated structures, separate anatomically succinct structures, these lymph nodes. And in the body, there's probably about 600 of these lymph nodes in different positions, obviously a lot in the axilla, a lot in the groin. That we're used to palpating to see if the, the lymph nodes are enlarged, of course. If the lymph nodes are enlarged, we call that a lymph adenopathy. And that can often be an indication of uh, infection. Now there's infoldings of this uh, dense capsule here into the, into the lymph node itself, generating uh, compartments within the lymph node. So there's compartments within the lymph node and these are called trabeculae, infolds of the outer fibrous membrane into the lymph node itself forming compartments. Now the reason for the lymph node really is that in the lymph node there is a fine network of connective tissues. Fine network of thin collagen strands like a scaffolding of 
thin collagen strands between the trabeculae. So a fine network, a reticulum of, of collagen strands within the lymph node. And the key thing about this is this provides a habitat and a structure for the immune cells. And the main immune cell, of course, associated with the lymphatic system are the, are the lymphocytes. So there's going to be B and T lymphocytes located throughout the lymph node. There's also going to be other immune cells, macrophages, and so-called dendritic cells, which are, which are actually a differentiated type of macrophage. So there's lots of immune cells here. And these immune cells can recognize if any bacteria come in. Remember, we could pick up some uh, bacteria from time to time from, from an infection. If these bacteria go down through the these lymphatics here, which are the afferent lymphatics, the afferent lymphatics will carry them into the into the lymph node. And in the lymph node, the lymph node is full of these immunological cells, so B and T lymphocytes. So the T lymphocytes are going to recognise the presence of the bacteria, or indeed viral uh, viral particles and they're going to uh, stimulate the B cells to produce uh, huge amounts of B cells called plasma cells and the plasma cells produce the antibodies and the antibodies of course will kill the bacteria so this is an early warning system so when the lymph is uh, the, the infection is still in the lymphatics way before it's got to the blood then the immune response can start off this specific immune response and as well as that, there's other cells in here. So there's uh, macrophages that will directly phagocytose any uh, bacteria that are getting in. So this is a, an immunological gatehouse, if you like. It's a, uh, an outer picket post for the immune system, uh, detecting the presence of bacteria, destroying them directly, mounting an acquired immunological response with the generation of specific antibodies even before the bacteria get anywhere near the blood when they're still confined to the lymphatic system and when there is bacteria in here there can be inflammation in these in these lymph nodes because the bacteria produce um, insulting chemicals that cause inflammation and as well as that the attack of the immune system is going to be uh, an inflammatory based attack so these are going to become inflamed and they can also become swollen because of the great increase in the number of the the, the white blood cells the, the leukocytic response to the infection as the there's a proliferation of white cells to combat this infection so the infl inflammation tends to make it painful we get uh, painful lymph nodes in infection um, um, uh, pa painful and tender to touch and also we get we get swelling because of the increase in numbers of immunological cells which causes the lymphadenopathy but of course this is exactly what we want we want this immunological response we want to find out what the infection is mount a specific response directly kill the viral and bacterial particles in the lymph node um, so if you're a bacteria or a virus coming in here <laughs> from the afferent lymphatics this is a lion's den you're probably going to get ripped apart which of course from our perspective is absolutely wonderful because what it means is that the drainage from the lymph node in the exiting in the efferent lymphatics this fluid in here should should be sterile and many uh, lymph nodes are going to uh, generate a lot of efferent lymphatic vessels and these are going to form progressively larger uh, efferent lymphatic vessels um, the larger ones are called trunks and again the lymphatic fluid is channeled in this direction with valves which will open in this direction to let the fluid through then close to prevent it going back the way and eventually this is going to drain into two of the 
or, or one of the two of the uh, lymphatic ducts in the body, the right and the left lymphatic duct. And eventually these are going to drain the lymphatic fluid back into the venous circulatory system to go back to the heart. So anything draining from the tissues has to be filtered through the lymph nodes before it can get back to the blood and this is the blood in here. So the blood should be kept sterile because this has already been through the lymphatic system before it gets back into the blood. But there is eventually a complete circulation there as the lymphatic fluid gets back into the, the bloodstream. Now I think I'll mention one more thing. Um, from time to time of course, unfortunately, some of these tissue cells become cancer cells. And one of the things about cancer cells is they lose their cell to cell adherence. So there's molecules on the surface of normal cells called adherence and that kind of sticks them together. But cancer cells lose these adherence so they tend to float away and they're floating around here in the tissues. But they also get through these flappy capillary walls. So that means that cancer cells can also be drained away in the lymphatic system. They will also be drained to the lymph nodes. And we hope that the immune system can do something about the cancer because if a cancer is immunological, immunologically recognised, of course it will be virtually instantly eradicated. So hopefully that happens most of the time. Um, but if it doesn't, the cancer cells will grow in here when we can get a lymphatic spread. So th th this, is, this is classic. So if we, if we suspect a, a tumour in the breast, for example, of course, we're going to palpate the the axillary lymph nodes to see what they uh, what they feel like and typically they're there if this cancer they're enlarged and hardened but uh, normally not painful because we're not getting the immunological uh, inflammatory response it's a pity because if we were that immune system would be eradicating the cancer cells so we end up with this uh, lymphatic spread and of course eventually that can lead on to potential hematogenic spread now here I have, uh, again from the Physiology Notes book, we'll just have a, uh, another diagram just to give us a slightly different perspective on what we've just said about the importance of the lymph node. So we notice that these compartments are called sinuses, that the tissue fluid is going in in these um, afferent lymphatic vessels into the lymph node. We remember that there's lots of these collagen fibres throughout the very fine reticula. Reticulum is a network, isn't it? It goes back to the days of Roman gladiators, a reticula, the gladiators with a net. A reticulum, a network, a network of, uh, of these. And uh, we also have the immune cells throughout here performing their vital immunological functions. And hopefully, most occasions, sterilising the lymphatics before it, the lymphatic fluid before it leaves via the uh, via the efferent lymphatic vessel. Now, what I've sketched out here is the crudest possible <laughs> um, circulatory system. Let's just see what we mean by these uh, these diagrams. So, uh, this would be the arterial side of the heart here taking blood into the arterial system through the capillaries and then draining to the uh, venous side through the capillaries, venous blood draining going back to the heart, to the venous side of the heart. So there we have a very crude circulatory system <laughs> and we know that we have Tissues in the body, these are the capillaries taking blood to the tissue cells. So there we have our tissue cells. And throughout the tissue cells we have these networks of lymphatic capillaries. So here's our 
uh, lymphatic capillaries. And these networks of lymphatic capillaries. And these are draining the lymphatic fluid away in afferent lymphatics. Other afferent lymphatics are meeting up, forming a lymph node. There's inclusions in there. And then that's uh, joining up. And of course the valves here are this way to make sure the flow is in the right direction. And these eventually, as we've said, are going to drain back into the circulatory system at these two specific points between the internal jugular and the uh, subclavian vein on the right and the left side. So eventually two lymphatic ducts taking this lymphatic fluid back into the circulatory system. So we have a blood circulation and we have this uh, lymphatic circulation as well. So the lymphatic circulation in this way through these vital lymph nodes taking the lymphatic fluid eventually to form a full circulatory system back into the back into the blood system. And again this diagram from the physiology notes book shows us a little more detail so we have the blood from the uh, left ventricle going onto the body here giving up its oxygen to the or some of its oxygen to the body draining back this way by the inferior and superior vena cava to that side of the heart blood going up to the lungs to be oxygenated blood going through the lungs getting oxygenated going back to the left side of the heart but also we notice that the systemic lymphatic capillaries which we've drawn here are picking up lymphatic fluid from the body draining them via afferent lymphatic vessels into the lymph nodes and the efferent lymphatic vessels taking the drained filtered lymphatic fluid back to the blood and it's the same it's the same with the lungs so there's pulmonary lymphatic capillaries as well we certainly don't want excess tissue fluid in the lungs do we what do we call that if there's too much tissue fluid in the lungs of course that's pulmonary edema which will uh, make you drown the, the alveoli will fill up with with uh, fluid we don't want that so we need to be constantly draining the lymphatic fluid from the lungs again that's going through uh, pulmonary lymph nodes because the chest infections are common we need to be able to eradicate those and again once the lymph has been through the lymph nodes it joins the uh, efferent lymphatics and we know that drains back into the circulatory system so again we have this complete uh, these complementary uh, circulatory systems the arterial system the uh, the venous system and the, uh, the lymphatic systems, the systemic lymphatic system, but also the pulmonary lymphatic system.